Welcome back to another training session in our exploration of functional analysis. If you are new here, a warm welcome to you and please don't forget to hit the subscribe button to become part of our growing community where we basically unravel the magic of mathematics. And to my dedicated viewers, I would like to, to say that um, your continued support keeps the mathematical flame burning bright, and I'm delighted to have you join me again. In our last episode, we uncovered the intricate um, world of the Ries Freedom theory, right? I mean, basically, talk about Ries theory, right? Peering into the connection between the compactness of the closed unit ball and the dimensionality of the mathematical space. Now, we are about to venture into another captivating realm, I mean, the, the realm of the Fred Holm um, alternative. Well, um, think of the Fred Home theory as a weather forecast for planning your outdoor activities. When you check the weather report, it gives you an idea of whether it will rain, snow, or be sunny, right? I mean, this information actually helps you um, decide whether to carry an umbrella, wear a warm coat, or pack some string. Similarly, the Fred Home theory works like a predictive tool in mathematics, informing us about the possibility of finding a solution to certain mathematical problems. I mean, it's like having a guide that tells um, that tells you or tells us um, whether a particular um, task can be completed using the available resources, or if we need to say adjust our approach to ensure a successful um, outcome. So to come back to the analogy of the weather forecast, so um, just as the weather forecast helps us planned for the day, right? The Fred Home theory assists mathematicians in preparing for solving complex equations, providing insights into the feasibility of finding solutions and the necessary adjustment to ensure um, to ensure success. So um, before we start, um, once again, um, please hit the subscribe button and be the Fred Home alternative to our mathematical voyage, paving the way for endless discoveries and insight that enrich our collective understanding. So I'll start by stating the theorem itself. So this will be um, theorem 616. And this is the famous um, Fred Holm alternative. Maybe write it down here. Probably have to shift a bit. Good. Now, what does it say? Um, let T right, be a compact operator from E onto itself, right? I mean, E is a Banach space. Then, um, I mean, you have a couple of properties that are fulfilled. Then um, the first one, I mean, A, the kernel of identity that I just denote by I, right? Identity minus T is finite dimensional. Right, so the second property is that um, we use another color, the range of identity minus t, right, which is basically the in the image of i minus t, right, is close. Oops. And more precisely. More precisely, um, we even have that. Um, I mean, the range of identity minus t is the orthogonal of the kernel of identity minus the adjoint of the adjoint of t. I mean, so this is the orthogonal of the kernel of i minus t star. So 
the third property is that um, the kernel of i minus t right is equal to the singleton zero right if and only if I will write it down here if and only if the range of i minus t is exactly the codomain height e. and finally we have that um, we call it z the last property is that the dimension of the kernel of i minus t right is exactly the dimension of the kernel of the adjoint and this is i minus t star the adjoint let me try to see how we can fit this good oops okay so before um, going to the proof let's have some remark right that we give you um a broad, of, a broad understanding of what the freedom theory actually um, says. So, remark um, the Fred home, so the Fred home alternative um, actually deals with, as I said, in the introduction like it deals with the solvability with the solvability of the equation put it in color u minus t u right which is again um which you can hide again as um, identity minus t u oh, no let me just write the equation u minus t o equals equals f right so it gives the solvability of this equation so it says that it says that um let's have some bullet points right that either for every f right either um, for every f in e right the equation u minus t u equal f has a unique solution Right. I mean, which I mean, in this case, actually, um, which of course, if and only if, I'll just write um, the abbreviation IFF, which of course, if and only if the homogeneous equation. The homogeneous equation um, u minus t u equals zero, right? Admit um, uniquely um, the trivial solution u equals to zero. Right, so this means, I mean, this is another way of saying that um, i minus t, right, is, I mean, the operator i minus t, identity minus t, right, is one to one. If and only if um, it is subjective. Right, so this is, I mean, this means that the kernel of i minus t equals to the singleton zero, right, if and only if, <coughs> sorry, if and only if the range of i minus t is exactly a 
and observe that this is um i mean how would i put it so this is exactly i mean the c property of the fret home alternative so either the equation u minus tu has um, minus tu equal f um has a unique solution right or i mean this is another bullet point or the homogeneous the homogeneous equation um again u minus two equals zero maybe i should highlight this the homogeneous the homogeneous um, equation u minus two equals to zero um admits and linearly independent solution right and in this case um in this case um the inhomogeneous equation oops the inhomogeneous equation and let me just try to think this should be okay in this case the inhomogeneous equation um u minus t u equals f right is solvable is solvable um if and only if f is actually in the range of identity minus t right but the range of identity minus t is again the i mean the kernel of the orthogonal of the kernel of the adjoint of i minus, minus t right so you see that this this is exactly the second condition of fred home alternative right and then from this you can even see already that the range of i minus t is actually um is close right because i mean the orthogonal of the kernel is actually um, a close set so this means that um f satisfies an orthogonality condition an orthogonality condition right because um I mean, because you have that f is actually in the in the kernel of a minus t star in the orthogonal of the kernel of, of identity minus the adjoint of t okay so um maybe you have another remark right which is also important so property c actually um I'm pretty sure you have already seen that, right? Property C is familiar, right, in finite dimensional um, setting. In finite dimensional spaces. You just highlight finite dimensional. It's very important here. Good. So if um I mean if E is finite dimensional, right? 
de línea um, copiar y todo from E into itself is injective like if and only if it is subjective Like and this is um and just first I like the key points. So in finite dimensional um space injectivity, I mean sure linear operator injectivity is equivalent to subjectivity. Like so this is just the um I mean the consequence of of the rank nullity theorem, right? For those who remember. So you can also look it up if you want. Okay, good. So, but it's actually important to note that in finite dimensional spaces, um, this doesn't hold right. So, however, in infinite dimensional spaces, um, let me just highlight infinite dimensional. So in finite dimensional in infinite dimensional spaces, um maybe I put it in color, a bounded operator a bounded operator may be injective, right, without being subjective. And conversely, of course, like right, you can have a an operator that is subjective but not um, but not injective. Well, you we can consider, for instance, um, consider, for example, um, the operator T defined on the space L two into L two n, right? Which at x Maybe it's map x to um, tx, which is just x2, x3. Right, so this is um, the so called um, left shift operator. Right, of course, and again, I mean. And x in L2 is a <coughs> sorry. <coughs> it's a sequence, right? This is the sequence um x in and the trickle on one, right? Okay. So this is the left shift operator and I claim that um t is not injective, right? But subjective. Right, and then um, I'm not going to prove that, right? But I invite you to consider the point x to be um, one. I mean, this sequence, right, which has one at the first position and zero else. Okay, so um, therefore, um, assertion C. Therefore, section C is, I mean, probably I recall it, right? That is um, the kernel of I minus T is singleton zero if and only if the range of I minus T is E, right? So, therefore, section C is a remarkable, it's a remarkable property. 
of, of the operators, I mean, of the operators, um, of the form, identity minus t, right? If t being a compact operator. Okay, so I think now, I mean, you're done, right? Uh, you now know what different home um, alternative um, does, right? And some of its implications. So let's go into the proof. So proof. Of the, I'll just write it. I'll just write F eighty for Fred Home Alternative Children. Right, so this is just short to Fred Home. Alternative theorem. Okay, so we start with the first assertion, right? So number A, right? So let's show that we put it in color. So let's show. Let's show that um, doesn't look straight. Okay. So <coughs> let's show that, sorry. So let's show that um, the kernel of identity minus t right is finite dimensional. So this is what you want to show. Okay, so for that, so let's go into the proof directly. So put E1, right? to be the kernel of identity minus t. So you want to show that E1 is finite dimensional. So what we are going to do is that, I mean, this is the rough idea of the proof. We are going to show that the closed unit ball in E1, right, is actually compact, right? And then use the RIS theorem that we saw in one of my previous video, right, to conclude that um, E1 is finite dimensional, right? You know, RIS theorem says that if you have a non vector space, right, for which the closure unit wall is compact, then E is finite dimensional, must be finite dimensional. Okay, so this is basically the rough idea of the proof. So put E1 to be the kernel of identity minus T, right? Um, I mean, this is, let me just, let's just kind of write fully what this is. So this is a set of X in E such that X is equal to TX, right? This is important to to note, right, because what I'm going to write next, we use that. So if E1 is the kernel of identity minus T, then the closed unit ball in E1, right, is actually contained into, into the um, the image of the closed unit ball where the compact operator T, right? I mean, this is, of course, because, I mean, the closed unit ball in E1 is exactly the set of X, in E1, right, such that the norm of X is less or equal than one, right? But this is exactly, um, I mean, we know that X element of E1 are element that can be written as TX, right? So the, those are the set of TX, such that the norm of X is less or equal than one. And this is obviously a subset of, of TBE. Okay, so, <coughs> Now, since T is, I mean, since T is a compact operator, let me just write, belong to KE, right? TBE has compact closure. Has compact closure and this Um, BE, right, is, I mean, BE1, sorry, 
is compact, right? Just write Y as close subset right, of a compact metric space. So now, because BE1 is compact, so by this theorem, I think this was even, um, I think this was theorem 6.5, I think so. So by this theorem, um, E1 must be finite dimensional. So the proof of A is done. Okay, we move to B. Okay, so for B, um, let's, um, let me let me once again remind what we want to show. So we want to show that so we want to show that um or we have to show that the range of identity minus t is close right and that this is even the kernel of I mean the orthogonal of the kernel of the adjoint. Okay, so this is what you want to show basically. Okay, <coughs> so let's start with closeness, right? For closeness, um, let fn right, be a sequence of point of the range. So let fn say equal to un minus t un, right? That converges to some point f in E, right? So we want, um, I mean, again, we have to show that, put it in quotation mark, we have to, so we have to show that um, F is an element of the range in order to conclude that um, the range of identity minus T is actually close, right? right? So this means, we have to find, I mean, to prove the existence of an element G in E, right, such that F equals G minus, minus TG. Okay, now, um, put, so set GN to be the distance of UN to the kernel of identity minus T, right? So I think we will again, right? Call this E1. Okay, good. Now, since E1 is finite dimensional, right, you know that this infimum is attained. I mean, the distance is defined by the infimum, right? So, since E1 is finite dimensional, it's finite dimensional, there exists, you know, there is. Um, there exists, I think it's better. There exists Vn, right, in, in E1, such that Gn equals the norm of Un minus Vn, right? Okay, now um, we have. We call it relation four, right? Because we have you referred to it later on. So you have Fn um, that can be written again as Un minus Vn, right? Minus T of Un minus Vn. Right? I mean, and this is of course, I mean, this equality actually holds because. Um, because Vn is an element of, of E1, right? 
you know that e1 i mean element of e1 uh characterized by the fact that they are equal to i mean they are like kind of fixed point right vn equal to tvn okay so our first claim is that so claim so we claim that the norm of we claim that um the norm of un minus vn remains bounded remains bounded okay so let's prove our claim um suppose not so we prove it by contradiction so suppose not suppose it is not the case right then there exists a subsequence Then there is a subsequence um, such that the norm of u and k, like let's call that subsequence u and k minus v and k, such that the norm of u and k minus v and a actually um, blows up, right? So it goes to infinity as k goes to infinity. Now set w um wn to be un minus vn i mean normalized vector right? divided by its norm norm of un minus vn now um from from four from relation four right um we see that so let me probably record version 4, right? So you don't have to probably stop the video and go. Version 4 says that fn is equal to un minus vn minus t of un minus vn. So from this relation, um, we see that wnk, right, minus t of wnk actually goes to zero, right? As k goes to plus infinity. Well, um, I mean, this is simply because WNK minus T of WNK is exactly equals to F of NK, right? Divided by the norm of UNK minus VNK, right? But the numerator actually goes to F and the, the denominator goes to, to plus infinity. So the quotient actually goes to zero. Okay, so now um, choosing Um, a further subsequence choosing a further subsequence like that we are not going to relabel so without relabeling without relabeling. Right, so choosing another subsequence that I'm not going to relabel, as I said, WNK, right, we may assume, we may assume um, that, we may assume that T of WNK actually goes to, goes to Z, right? I mean, well, you're probably wondering whether such a subsequence actually exists, but this is actually the case because I mean, let me put it here. This is, I mean, this is possible, right? Because the norm of W n equals one, right? So this means um, W n is actually, I mean, an element of the closed unit ball in E, right? And T so it's a compact operator. So let me just write T is compact. Right? So the image of the closing ball has compact closure. So we can find a subsequence right such that um, the image sequence actually converges. So such a subsequence actually exists. So thus, we have that WNK actually goes to Z, right? And um, 
and z is an element of the kernel of like so we denoted this to be one well um again i'm just to justify why um in fact i mean this whole because um i mean w n k like you say i mean those are element of the kernel of identity minus t right and you know that the kernel of i minus t is closed right so whenever you have a sequence of element in the kernel in the kernel right that converges then the limit must be um, an element of the kernel okay so so that i mean so that the distance of w and k right to e1 actually goes to zero right? so that w and k converge to z and c of w and k goes to z so the distance of w and k to e1 actually goes to zero right um and on the but on the other hand i mean on the other hand um i mean the distance of w n to e1 right is equal to the distance of u n to e1 divided by the norm of u n minus v n and this is exactly one right because in, so this is one because vn is an element of the kernel of identity minus t right and remember that the norm of u n minus v n was exactly g n right it was the distance of u n to to e1 but this is actually a contradiction <coughs> sorry this is actually a contradiction right because you have um, a sequence um i mean the distance of w n to e1 that goes to i mean that is one right so how you kind of extract a subsequence that actually goes to zero so this is um so which is a contradiction right because as i said you have distance of w and k e1 goes to zero and you have this you know that this distance is actually constant for every n right so this is a contradiction so there's the norm of u n minus v n remains bounded as claimed um, earlier now and since T is a compact operator. We may extract the subsequence. And we can extract the subsequence. Um, such that the image of that subsequence that we extracted t of w of u of, of t of um, u n k minus v n k converges in the other side converges to some limit l right of course as k goes to plus infinity now from four once again right from four um you probably recall it i mean that is four says that fn could be written as un minus vn minus t of un minus vn so from four it follows that It follows that um let me put it this way unk minus vnk 
it converges to to f minus sorry to f cross l right because remember that we had already the convergence of f n to to f right so now um let's sing i mean let's sing g to be f plus l right you have that z minus tg equals equals f right so in fact um let me put it here by boundedness of t right by boundedness of t i mean you have that t of u and k minus v and k right actually convert i mean you can put the limit inside because t is continuous right you can put the limit inside and this will convert to t of f plus l right but by uniqueness of the limit this should be should be l right we saw that um t of u and k minus v and k converges to l so this should be this should be l right this is by uniqueness of the of the limit so if you put j to be f plus l then you see that g minus tj equals to equals to f right so this means that f is of just say in the range of identity minus t right hence hence um, the range of i minus t is close right and um, again um well this is i mean this is even equivalent i mean this implies so it means it's even an equivalence right i strongly i invite you to prove it and again i mean if you have any issue any comment any any, any question feel free to drop it in the comment and i'll be happy to to provide an answer or assist you so this is even equivalent to um to say that um the range of identity minus t is the kernel of i mean the adjoint i mean the orthogonal of the kernel of the adjoint right but the adjoint of identity minus t is exactly the kernel of i minus the adjoint of t right and again this is equivalent to say that the range of i minus t star right is equal to the orthogonal of the kernel of i minus t good so we are done with properties i think it was um, a session b yeah so we are done with a session b then let's move to c so in c um now let's prove that Let's prove that. Let me just style it a bit. So now we want to prove that the kernel of identity minus t is the singleton zero, right? If and only if the range of identity minus t equals to to e, right? Okay. So um, we start with the first implication, right? So we want to prove an equivalent, so. Start with the first implication. So assume the kernel of identity minus t equals to the singleton zero. Now m to a contradiction. Doesn't look nice. So m to Aiming to a contradiction, um, assume that now we call E1 the range of I minus T. So assume that the range of I minus T is actually different from E, right? Then E1 is a Banach trace. Right. Like, 
Then E1 is the Banach space height as close subspace of a complete metric space height. So probably I should write it here as close subspace. I mean, you prove that the range of identity minus T is was close, right? As close subspace of a complete. Metric space. Okay, so E1 is the Banach space, and again the image of T E1 is actually contained into into E1, right? But this is, I mean, the story is the same, right? For what we did already. Um, in fact, this is exactly the set of point T U, right? Such that U is in E1, right? E1 now is the range, right? E1 now is the set of point Z minus TZ, right? Such as Z is in, is in E. So this is um, again equals to the set of point. Um, I'll just go, I mean, go one step further, right? So of set TZ minus T of TZ, right? Such that Z is in E. But you can even write this as say like v minus t v, right? Such that v is equal to t z with some z in some z in e, and this is obviously um contained into into e one, right? So okay, so um that's because t e one is contained into e one, right? That's um. T or initial compact operator, right? Associated to E1 is again a compact operator from E1 into itself, right? That's I mean. the range of this, right? Um, can we denote it? So the range of T is associated to E1, right? It's a subset of subset of E1. So this is a compact operator and E2 that are defined to be identity minus T of E1, right? It's a closed subspace. It's a closed subspace of of E1. For the simple reason that um yeah, it's a closed subspace of E1, right? There is nothing to to add on this. Okay, so moreover, um, E2 is different from E1, right? Since um, identity minus T is injective, right? Because the kernel is a singleton zero, so it is injective. So this actually means that. Um, I mean, E2 is actually strict in your proper, very proper subspace of, of E1. Now, letting, um, letting En to be identity minus T to the, to the power N. I mean, the power here is not in the sense that you usually know, right? Like, this is the composition, right? Like, N times composition of identity minus T, right? Like, so letting En to be this, right? Like, I mean, this is similar to say that en plus one is identity minus t of en, right? So letting en to be this, right? We obtain um, we obtain a strictly strictly decreasing. Of closed subspace subspaces of closed subspaces. Now, um, again, using the RIS lemma.
mean this was um Nima 611. I was only invited to watch my video on on the race um the race for at home theory like so I discussed the race lemma over there and also the race theory. So um we have a circuit decreasing sequence of closed subspaces, right? And using the release lemma, we may, I mean, we can construct. We may construct. We may construct um, a sequence. UN, right? Such that, um, U and uh, element of EN, right, with norm one, right, they are being restricted to the units here, and the distance of UN to EN plus one, right, is actually um, greater or equal than one over two, right, I, again, oops, it's greater than one over two. Well, this is the race lemma applied with epsilon equal 1 over 2. So, we have, um, so we have, um, graph that, probably not the norm, let me just write first. We have T U N minus T U M, right, is equal to minus U N minus T U N, right, plus um, let me write it here to save some space plus u m minus t u m plus u n minus minus u m right i mean you can take this easily right i mean observe that the u n here and here we cancel out right and the u m here and here we also cancel out right? so both, I mean, this equality actually it holds, right? This is, I mean, you can rewrite T U N minus T U N um, as being um, the element on the right hand side. Now, um, note that, now note that um, if N is strictly greater than M, right, then En plus one is contained into En, right? Which is contained into into En plus one. I mean, this is because we saw that the sequence that we constructed was strictly decreasing, so there's nothing strange here. And therefore, and therefore, um, minus Un minus T. Un right plus Um minus T Um right plus Un. Hmm. Yeah, I have to squeeze it now. Somehow. Hmm. So this is an element of. E m plus one, right? I mean, um, this is simply because, um, I mean, this is an element of E n plus one, right? This is an element, and yet E n plus one is contained to E m plus one, right? And this is an element of E m plus one, and this is in E n. So this is obviously an element of E m plus one. So it follows that. So it follows that if I now take the norm of T U N minus T U M, right? This should be greater equal than the distance of U M to E M plus one. Right? And this is greater equal than one over two. Right? I mean this is because I mean so that this was 
an element of of u m plus okay so um but this is actually impossible right i mean this relation here is impossible just highlight impossible right impossible because u n oops because u n is is bounded right i mean the bounded sequence and t is a compact operator so we should be able to extract the convergent subsequence but this is not the case here right because you have the norm of of t u n minus t u n uh, being greater than one over two so this is impossible hence um just like the range of identity minus t equals c okay now let's deal with the reverse amplification um conversely assume that conversely assume that um the range of identity minus t is equal to e oops right then i mean i invite you to prove this what i'm about to to say so i do then we know that the kernel of identity minus t star which is exactly the range of i minus t i mean orthogonal right but because the range of identity minus t is e so this is the orthogonal of e and the orthogonal of e is exactly the the singleton zero now since the adjoint right is also a compact operator oops from the dual space into itself right i mean this is um, by the shoulder theorem right this is by shoulder shoulder theorem i think this was um, theorem 6.4 I put the link to the video so i'll just take my previous video yeah. so since the adjoint of the compact operator is also a compact operator right we may i mean we may apply um the preceding step right the preceding step to infer that The range of identity minus t star is exactly e star and again you may apply that because we saw that the kernel of identity minus t star was actually singleton zero so it, by the previous step by the previous implication the range of identity minus t star should be the dual space of e and again um sorry and again the kernel of identity minus t right is equal to and this you can prove again right but it's not difficult this is the orthogonal of the range of identity minus t star right and this is exactly what the orthogonal of the adjoint right but this is exactly the singleton zero so this means that the kernel of identity minus t is the singleton zero good so um we are done with property c right 
Um, now let's move to the final one. So Z, um, you want to curve? Let's curve that. In Z, we want to prove that the dimension of the kernel. Let's prove that. Um, put it in color once again. The dimension of the kernel. Oops. The kernel of identity minus t, right? Is exactly the dimension of the kernel of the adjoint, or the kernel of identity minus t star. Okay, so that um, for that put. Um, let's say G to be the dimension of the kernel of I minus T and G star, right, to talk about the dimension of the kernel of the adjoint. So we want to show that G equals to G star. Well, but before, um, let's recall some basic fact, um, recall. Mm, let me just write it in this color, it doesn't matter. So recall that um, probably I use this to emphasize the first point. Recall that every finite dimensional, every finite dimensional subspace. G admits a complement. Right. Indeed, um, maybe this is kind of a short proof. Indeed, let um, E1 up to EN right, be a basis, right? Of G of the space G, right, which is finite dimensional. Now every x in G may be written as um, x equals to the summation of the x i e i i running from one to from one to n. Now put um, phi i of x right being equal to x i. This kind of a kind of a projection on the I coordinate right so now um, we can use um, using when phi is obviously a linear bounded functional right on on the space G. So using um hand Banach analytic form hand Banach analytic form um each phi i, I mean, can be extended can be extended by a continuous linear functional linear functional um, c phi i chipped, right, define now on E right. Good. Now you should put L capital L to be the intersection of phi i tilde minus one of the singleton zero. Like I running from one to n, then um, L is the complement of G, right, in the sense that in the sense that L is closed, right, this is obvious L is closed, the intersection of L and G is the singleton zero, right and G plus L equals to the whole space E okay, so um, Okay, good. Now another recall is that um, every closed subspace G of finite codimension admits a complement. Every closed subspace 
Should I have a closed subspace? G, right? Of finite condemnation. That meets a complement. Well, um, the proof is relatively easy, right? It suffices to um, to choose to choose any um, finite dimensional finite dimensional space. Let's call it L, right? Such that um, the intersection with J is the singleton zero, right? And J plus L is, I mean, is equal to E, right? I mean, and of course, L is close, right? Because it is finite dimensional. So, okay, so now let's go back to the proof. Now let's go back to the proof. Um, we start with this inequality. So we want to show that. Let's show that. Put it in color that G is greater or equal than G star. So this is what we want to show. Then we will proceed by contradiction once again. So suppose not. Right, suppose not. So the means. So assume that G is strictly less than G star. Now, since the kernel of identity minus T, I minus T, right, is finite dimensional. It admits, right, I mean, due to our recall, right, it admits a complement in E, right, so that we find a dimensional um, such space um, has a complement. So it admits a complement in E, thus the resist. Um, the continuous projection mm, let's call it from E onto the kernel of identity minus T right? let's call it P right? from E into the kernel of identity minus T now on the other hand On the other hand, the range of identity minus t, right, which is again the kernel, I mean the orthogonal of the kernel of the adjoint, right, has finite codimension g star. Has finite codimension that we call g star, right, and thus, I mean, also has a complement. And thus has a complement in E, of course, right? Denoted by, I mean, we call that um, complement F, right? Denoted by, by F, right? And that complement is, of course, of dimension this term. Now, um, since since G is actually um, strictly less than G star, right? There is a linear map. I mean, there is an injection. There is a, there is a linear map, right? That we call um, which 
I define from the kernel of identity minus t into f, right? That is injective. And not subjective. So we can basically construct such a map, right? Now put um, set capital S right to be T plus weight composed with the projection P. Then um, S is a compact operator from E from E um, into itself. Compact operator because um, since I mean compact operator has sum of two compact operators right because which composed with P has finite rank right so and we saw that any finite rank operator is compact operator has finite rank and also yeah so we know that the space of I mean of compact operators is a linear subspace of the space of linear bounded operators. So, well, S is obviously a compact operator from E into itself. Now we claim that, um, claim, so we claim that the kernel of identity minus S is existing beta zero, right? Indeed, if zero equals u minus su, right, which is again equal u minus t u um, minus weight composed with p applied to u, right, then u minus t u equals to zero and which compose with you by to you equals to zero. Well that was a bit fast, right? I think I so let me tell you why this holds so observe that so let me just do something. Good, and now we style it a bit. Mm. Good. Well, okay. I thought this actually, I mean, this condition that I just um, um, circle, right, means that, I mean, from this you get that u minus t u is equal to which composed with u, composed with, um, with p applied to u, right? But this is an element, yeah, I should use another color. But this is an element of the range of identity minus t, right? And this is an element of of f, right? And we know that f is actually the complement of the range, right? But the range of identity minus t intersected with f, right, is the singleton zero, right? As f is the complement. the complement of the range of identity minus t right so for that we have that u minus t u equal to zero and the projection of um, i mean which composed with the projection applied to u is equal to zero so this means so from that we get that u is actually in the i mean the kernel sorry in the kernel of identity minus t and this fall from the first um the first I mean, this follows from this one here. Okay. And now you also get that gamma of u, because u is actually in the kernel, so weight composed with p, right, applied to u, is again weight applied to u, right? So maybe I should write it fully for your understanding. So this is exactly with of u, and this is equal to zero. Okay, so therefore we can conclude. Therefore, u is exactly zero, right? Because which is injective, which is injective, right? I mean, it's one to one. 
okay so hence um, the kernel of identity minus s is equal to the singleton zero now if you apply c to this like applying applying c to i mean to s right which is compact operator from e into itself right so let me just write that c i mean assertion c that we prove right we obtain that we obtain that the range of identity minus s is exactly it's exactly e but this is impossible but oops but this is impossible um, looks ugly but this is impossible because um, there is some f right one can find there is some f in in f right with f not being <coughs> sorry with f not being in the in the range of weight right I mean, remember that. Um, um, I mean, the range of weight is actually strictly contained in two F, right? So, we saw that weight. I mean, the way we constructed weight was um, in a way that it is not subjective; it is not onto. So and so. For such a f right, the equation u minus s u equals f right, right has no solution. Let me drag it a bit to the left, but has no solution. Hence. The adjoint of, I mean, not, not the adjoint, I mean, this star, it's quite confusing. So, hence, this star is actually less or equal than Z, right? Okay, now, um, now let's move with the, let me check again, which implication, which, yes, of you. Okay, so now, for the reverse inequality, right, I mean, it's enough for us to apply what we did already so applying um this fact by this fact i mean what we just proved right but applying this fact to um to t star i mean to the adjoint of of t right you obtain that the dimension of the kernel of identity minus t star star right is actually less so equal than the dimension I think I have to to decrease my handwriting the dimension of the kernel of identity minus t star star right it's less so equal than the dimension of the kernel of identity minus minus t star right which is actually less this we this we proof already less than kernel of identity minus t of identity minus t but the kernel of identity minus t right is actually um a less or equal to contain into the kernel of identity minus t star star right which means that the dimension of the kernel of identity minus t is less or equal than the dimension of 
the kernel of um, identity minus t star star. Right? So this means that um, the dimension of the kernel of identity minus t right, is less or equal than the dimension of um, well, I think let me just to keep it short. So, but on the other hand, you have that this is less or equal than the dimension of um, of the kernel of identity minus t star. Right? I mean, um, this follows from oops. This follows from. Can I miss it? So this all from this right. okay so um so this means if i replace that g is actually less or equal than g star right which is less or equal than g hence g equals to g star so this means that the dimension of the kernel of identity minus t is exactly the dimension of the kernel of identity minus minus t star and with this um, we end the proof of the thread from alternative and also we also end this lecture so if you like this video um, I strongly invite you to subscribe to the channel to so as not to miss um, future videos and to stay updated. And again, as I always say, subscribing to the channel, I mean, it's not just about following along, right? It's also about being part of a community where you will learn a lot, right? And also kind of um, sharpening your mathematical knowledge and understanding. So thank you very much and see you in the next video.